Drive Guys, episode 14, Avoiding Burnout. Dan. Joe, good morning. Good morning. A very stern good morning. How are you? I am good. I'm good. I, I'm changing with the seasons. The season of reading is over. The spring of Aww. reading is over for me. It's been good. Reading is now part of my weekly routine. Good. In the last three months, I've read seven books. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty proud of that. And so now the summer of creativity has begun as part of my year of prestige. I'm expanding my non-work projects and uh, one of them being this pod- podcast. And so my summer is all about getting creative outside of work. So I'm really excited for that. So I feel enthused today at the start of summer. What about you? How, how are things with you? I have been incredibly busy. I've been doing uh, a lot of audio work. Um, Kerry's actually been back in the office this week. So it's been pretty quiet, which is a bittersweet. You know, there's there's not really much going on in my house now. It's just me and River pottering around. I imagine that's quite strange to go from, you know, having someone sitting behind you pretty much every day to them, 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 them not being there. Yeah, I've been kind of hoping that when she goes back, because, you know, she's not on the phone all day anymore. So it's like, you know, peace and quiet. But now it's almost gone in the, the opposite direction. It's too quiet. Uh, in other news, my favorite room in the house has opened up again, um, which is the lean to. It's been oh, out, nice. of, out of service for around six to seven months, I believe, because we had our old sofa in there. We decided to swap our sofa out and it was massive. That's why we swapped it, because it was too big for the two of us that were living there. Mm. so we put the old one in the lean-to and it's just kind of been sat there gathering dust until someone could pick it up we had someone lined up to pick it up but because of covid we've uh, not been able to facilitate that so right. i've had nowhere to put it and i didn't want to move it and like just chuck it in the garden because the guy wanted to pick it up um so that's gone that's the right. um good news this week you know and that lean-to well i guess now it's getting a little bit warmer as well you can actually use it without without a jacket maybe exactly it's just in time so i'm pretty happy about that decent that's good that's good Should we do win of the week? Yeah, and in the interest of the subject that we're talking about today, which is burnout, uh, I figured I'd take this one for you. Listeners, please stand by as I've not had a chance to practice. I literally lifted and shifted this. So (laughs) win of the week is a segment at the top of each show where we get to share something that's happened this week that we'd like to celebrate. Just to make sure we start our conversation on a positive note, we post a reminder on our platforms every Friday. So if you'd like to share your win of the week with us, Tag us on your post on Twitter or Instagram at Thrive Guys Pod or hashtag Win of the Week. Fantastic. I'll maybe try it with a bit more energy next time, but it's, it's weird not doing it. So it was, it was nice to have a break. You know, it's important to take a break from things that you do all the time. So oh, well done. Exactly. So you can start with your win of the week. What have you won at this week? So my win this week is a very simple one, but a very fundamental one to the uh, the fibre of my existence, and anybody who knows me uh, outside of uh, outside of the, the the world that we're in at the moment knows that I love a good takeaway. This week I did not have a takeaway. Now that sounds like it's not really something to win at, but actually the the quantity of take takeaways for me is actually a fairly good barometer of my state of mind. And uh, for a while we were getting up to two per week, which is quite bad, you know especially given the choices around the small village that I, I live in. You know, it's either a kebab or a curry. And, well, that's it. That's your choice, They're both right? glorious, though. This is why I have them twice a week, right? <laughs> I love a good takeaway. You know, as I said earlier, you know, that this is one of the ways that I get joy out of life is food. And it's not the high quality, you know, double Michelin star type food. It is the you know, the, ke- the, the the kebab or the takeaway down the road, getting as much of it as possible and eating it until I hate myself. That is kind of my <laughs> my, uh, my my way of getting joy out of life. So, you know, this week we avoided hitting up Just Eat and the three things that we have available on there. So, so it's only a small win, but the output and the upshot of it is we did have some nice home-cooked meals um, and cooking is part of, you know, it's a therapeutic exercise for me actually when I'm in the mood for it and... I'm pretty good at it as well. Um, from, you know, I say that to you, Dan, as someone who's experienced my cooking in the past and uh, you seem to have enjoyed it. Oh, I still talk about the mushroom Wellington. That stands out. You know, you have some meals in your life and it's not to sit here and, you know, basically build you up, right? You know, I can do that off off the podcast. <laughs> Sometimes we need it. So I, I, yeah. I'm, I'm listening. I remember that mushroom Wellington. I can still visualize it in my head. It was so tasty. 
And even the gravy was tasty. Just nice. the whole meal itself, the whole experience, I still remember now. And there's a few meals like that in my life, and that's one of them. So I commend you for that. Well, I appreciate that. And that was probably three years ago, I reckon, because we yeah, just moved into, we'd just been here maybe a year in this house. So I had a mustache then. I know that. I you did. <laughs> you did. I saw the photo from it. It comes up uh, every couple of years. Oh, Someone wow. always says that I look like one of these politicians, which is, <laughs> which is using a, you know, it's, it's quite a light description, but. A light description, yeah. It's putting it lightly, definitely. I, I would, I would use a different P word, but uh, um, this is a family show. So, so yeah, that's my win of the week. So, Dan, what's uh, what's your win of the week? So, there's two. Uh, I had one about automation. Um, okay. I, I configured a load of automation tasks, which have saved me actually hours of work this week. But we've already planned to talk about automation next week, so I'm just going to kind of sideline that. But that's one of my wins. Okay. Um, my other win is on your recommendation, getting that MX Master 3 mouse. Brilliant. Expensive. But, and I, I didn't really want to justify the purchase because yeah. it's a mouse. And when I say that out loud again, like with the keyboard, I was like, it's a mouse. Like, what am I going to get out of it? A point and click. Yeah. For context, though, it is a, it's, a, it's a 100 pound mouse. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. And I've been using the same mouse literally for about four years now before mm. this. I just haven't bothered changing it ever. Um, so the, the kind of benefit of it and the, the win for me is that I set up the shortcut button. So it's got a side click and I set mm. that up as my shortcut screenshot on the Mac and yep. um, for something called Screenshot Capture, which is in our apps list. Right. Um, so on my work machine, I can just press that. And I already had a hotkey for it for like Alt S or something like that. But now I just don't have to do it. So I can be clicking around and go, right, I need to screenshot that or get a snippet and just press it. So you don't even have to take your hand off the mouse. It's literally just you hit your thumb on the mouse and it's a screenshot. Nice. Exactly. And same with the infinite scroll. I've just not had it on any of my old mice. Yeah. Um, and it's really cool. You know, if you're scrolling through loads of data, which thankfully the automation task that I've been doing actually involved doing that originally. So using the infinite scroll, which is where the, you know, you just scroll down and it keeps going and going and going. You just flick it. And it just goes. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's wicked. Yeah. It's um, really therapy. It's just nice to do as well, even if you're not, um, if, you've, if you're not scrolling on anything. It's just nice to just play with. Well, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, I, the horizontal scroll is a new thing for me. I've just never had it. Um, I'm, you know, maybe when I was doing, you know, IT in school or something. But uh, yeah, the horizontal scroll has been wicked just for going through spreadsheets or whatever you're doing at the time. Absolutely. Just, I mean, it's it's one of those that that's what originally got me onto the MX Master series. It the the horrors I was, I think what it was is I was I was I worked with quite a lot of big spreadsheets and um, I was just getting a little bit frustrated with having to go down to the bar at the bottom and then drag the bar at the bottom and and you know who wants to do that I mean you see people over the age of fifty doing that on their on their laptops and it's like oh god you, you do know that there's a there's a better way um, so yeah that that was what originally put me onto the master the MX Master series and and uh, I mean I got an MX Master two first. And um, I only replaced it recently, as you know, because that died a death. Mm. And so, you know, I got the the three, and you guys in uh, in our WhatsApp group, uh, you know, you and friend of the show David Bogner, uh, absolutely <laughs> rinsed me for the amount of money that I spent on a mouse. And uh, lo and behold, a day later, you got a, a ship a shipment from Amazon, and uh, yeah, the rest you is know, history. You know, sometimes I think it's just worth trying these things out. If I didn't like it, I was going to send it back. But I thought it it has just brought me joy. It's yeah. got a little thumb gesture when you're holding it on the bottom side of it which you can just use to cl like either close your apps or to open the windows button yep. or to just um go into like the the wider view where you can see all the apps that you've got open yeah so it's nice that like, you're just working away and somebody will message you and you can press that instead of going down to your notification you've just got it right in front of you so yeah really good purchase excellent i'm glad you i'm glad you're enjoying it for a lot of people it's like 100 pounds on a mouse is insane right get that completely but get one try it and if you don't like it, return it. But I mean, you're definitely not the first person that I've steered onto these kind of mouses and you probably won't be the last. There's also another thing about it, right? I, I, I actually set it up. So before the process was that my mouse, I would have to unpair from my work laptop and then pair to my, uh, my Mac for podcasting. I just never really thought anything of it. I was like, it's just what we have to do because it doesn't recognize it. Um, once you pair between two devices it's like right i can't tell which one it is it's only got one bluetooth radio basically yeah, yeah exactly so with this it's got a button on the bottom where you can switch between um three different devices so i've got it paired to my ipad to my mac and to my work machine and i thought it can't be that simple when it comes to this literally i 
pl- uh, you know, I'd been working on my work laptop all of yesterday, switched to my Mac because I've got the, um, the dock on my desk. Yeah. Turned on the mouse, flicked it to setting two or whatever it is, is one, two or three. Uh, and it just started working. And I was just like, peace, bliss. <laughs> If you're living that multi-computer lifestyle, which a lot of us are, right? You know, you know. I think I think it's fair to say that if you're productivity grease monkeys like us, you've you've at least got more than one laptop or w- more than one computer. Having a keyboard and a mouse that you can consistently and easily switch between all of your machines is it's just it is joyful, right? Yeah, you know, it's there's nice. no better way of putting it. And so we've both got the Keychron K2 keyboard, and um, you know the the function one, two, and three allows you to switch between three the three Bluetooth radios, which you can then pair to sort of separate machines. And it's the same on the mouse as well. So if you needed to boot up a, another computer, you would just go right function whatever to to switch it to that computer, and then hit the button on the back of this uh, mouse, and then good to go. So yeah, no, it's it's things like this, little small things that just are little sprinkles of uh, of joy in a in what. A lot of people think it's a very boring subject of, you know, computers and keyboards and mice. Well, that was my point. A mouse is a mouse to me. That's all it's ever been. And I, I as soon as I started using it, I was like, I kind of get it. <laughs> I yeah. Can, I can program different buttons. I've actually got my second button on the side is set to just load up a Notion page. Nice. So it's cool when I'm like, I need to make a note. I just press that and it loads up Notion. There we go. So cool. Little thing. Welcome but to yeah. the jungle. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the jungle, my friend. So... Today's episode is all about avoiding the dreaded burnout. So if, if, uh, if dear listener, you asked any one of our friends, they'd probably support the position that Dan and I take a lot, on a lot. And mm. we're always doing something. There's always, you know, we've got our fingers in many, uh, many pies, so to speak. And I'm sure a lot, of, a lot of our listeners are the same. You know, with the increased expectations on our professional lives, and the almost mandatory requirement for anyone our age or, or similar to have a side hustle of some sort, all of that left unchecked can get quite overwhelming, right? And so today, I thought it would be a good opportunity to talk about how we identify the signs of, of, of burnout and, and when we might be close to, to burnout and what we do in that moment to manage those kind of those those feelings and those symptoms i guess and uh then what we ultimately do to to try and rebalance the books uh because burnout is no joke you know in in fact in 2019 the world health organization classed it as an occupational phenomenon which kind of sounds like they wanted to try and class it as a as a medical condition but it wasn't quite there yet uh, you know, my experience from talking to different people is that burnout can manifest itself in, in different ways. But Dan, why don't you start us off with, with what is burnout? What is this? And then, you know, we can jump in from there in terms of, you know, identifying what it means to us. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, the term we're actually talking about, um, burnout, is the shortened version of occupational burnout. So it's specific to your job. Um, and it's basically the result of prolonged stress, essentially. So it's a feeling of like hopelessness, which ultimately leads to a decline in productivity. Um, so I guess to summarize, it's feelings of negativity or cynicism, but broadly relating to your job or your career. Um, and I guess that's purely down to the fact of, you know, where do you spend the majority of your time? And it's mm. work, you know. Not a lot of us are working part time. We're all full time workers, and we, you know we've all got a side hustle. <laughs> well, most yeah. of us. Do you know what I mean? And I'm going to say something in my own personal experience, and I'm going to apologise in advance for you having to censor this. But as a key identifier of burnout, I call it the "fuck it" feeling, because that's how I feel. Um, I have. I just haven't found another more suited alliteration that defines how it makes me feel. And that's no. how I identify burnout for myself. Is I just yeah, yeah. I feel when like you start saying feeling... it to anything. Yeah, you start feeling the flip it feeling. Yeah, that's better. Yeah, I, I I totally agree. And I suppose for me, I only start to tell when I'm close to my limit, when my diary starts to quieten, because I'm you know so focused on the do the do the do the do the do, and actually just getting through each day right and and executing on whatever it is that I need to do that day that I only start realizing that. Um, I'm approaching that kind of pre-burnout phase when things start to quieten down. You know, I'll give you an example. So last week we talked about my win of the week being actually uncoupling from the world of work and and, mm-hmm. and disconnecting and, and doing all of that good stuff. But the last couple of weeks before my holiday, 
my diary was a fair bit quieter than normal. And so the, the telltale sign for me being kind of close to, close to the edge is not having the energy to get to the proactive action items on my list every day. And so, you know, I've got the stuff that's scheduled in my diary, but then there's other things that I need to go out and get and go out and do, you know, that aren't reactive. And if I'm putting that stuff off and I'm putting off getting to something that maybe requires a bit more than just jumping on a call or whatever it might be, then I know that I've, I'm clinging on with my with my index finger and my thumb to that last bit of rope i i, I was thinking about like a good analogy for this and i've thrown a couple at you so far but yeah, i think yeah i think I, I've, I've settled on one and it's almost like the the frog in the pot uh, i don't know if you know this analogy yeah. right? it's, it's i'm a frog i'm in a pot of water and it's slowly boiling without me realizing it but actually the pot is not a pot it's a pressure cooker the prop the problem that i have is I get to the point where I have to take the pot off the boil, but it's only when it's like ninety nine degrees that I go right. It's got to go. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm about to, I'm about to get boiled, um, and that's what I did. You know, it was, it was basically some short term leave that I took, and I went right, hit the eject button, and and I need to just switch everything off and just actually take time for myself and 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 all of that sort of stuff. I mean, thankfully, I've never actually burnt out before. I've never had to be signed off or anything like that. I always managed to kind of catch it before I, you know, before I cook myself well that's one of the key points isn't it is identifying it yeah yeah ex- ac- exactly one thing i do need to improve on is is doing the the preventative stuff versus just you know hitting the eject button getting the hell out of dodge so i think for me i know the feelings that i feel and the things that i i kind of see as okay this is where i need to be mindful of where i'm at in terms of my headspace there's four things that i've kind of narrowed it down to so the, the the first telltale sign for me is I don't make it if I don't make it past three o'clock without spacing out at least twice. You know, if if that's if that's happening, if I don't make it past three p.m. without just like you know spending half an hour on my phone, then then I'm good. You know, so if I if I am doing that, then I'm getting I'm getting near to the edge. Um, the second thing is my my diet. You know, if I start having two takeaways a week, as I said before, in win of the week. Um, or if my yeah, if I start eating more sugary food or junk food or whatever, if that all takes a turn for the worse, family pack of biscuits. Exactly, exactly. That's when I know I'm kind of taking a bit of a bit of a bit of a bum steer, a bit of a wrong turn. The the third thing is I stop getting joy out of winning business. You know, that's what I do. It's it it's the thing that's great about my job is that there is that kind of dopamine cycle, and you know, it's a longer dopamine cycle than probably we're all used to now with social media and everything like that. But it is there. You know, you put in the work, you win the business there's that great feeling and blah, 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 you know. It's- well, we've discussed this as well, right? You don't just work for the money. You have to experience some sort of joy out of doing what you do. Otherwise, totally. it's meaningless. It's like meaningless. Like at the same, when, I, you know, when I'm fixing things, you know, the stress can kind of happen. But once it's fixed, there's that release and you just, I'm, you know, at least it's fixed and I'm, I'm proud to some extent. So, I, you know, I fully relate to that. Exactly. And when I stop feeling that, and I'm, and I'm, I'm sure you're the same, when, when it's just like, oh, yeah, fix another thing. Who cares, though? You know, yeah. that's when it's like, right, hang on a minute. Like, I need to check in with myself and understand what the hell I'm feeling, right? That's when you go back to the flip it feeling. Or the, the, exactly. Yeah. When you say, exactly. like, oh, yeah, I fixed it, but flip it, you know. But what's the point? Who cares? You know, yeah, nobody's exa- going to notice anyway. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's all just meaningless anyway. And why, why would I bother? And yeah, it's, 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 uh, those are kind of telltale signs for me. Um, and the fourth one is that I start putting off work that might be a little bit uncomfortable. So if there's a conversation that I don't really want to have, but I know I need to have it, right? I'm usually pretty good at that. I just kind of, you know, get to it head on. You know, we're all adults here, right? Um, but if I keep putting that off, and if I put it off for more than like a handful of days, then it's like, okay, I probably need to take a take a you know a pause and uh, and start doing some of the the tactics that I um that I that I employ to get myself out of this kind of funk so that, that's kind of it for me that's how I, I identify those feelings for me i mean what what about you dan what how do they manifest themselves for for you well it's very very similar um it's for me it starts off with a feeling of just not wanting to do anything at all and just doing the mundane you know just doing the <laughs> daily rigmarole um so even the yeah. simplest of tasks become a huge chore like 
change, you know, let's say charge the ring doorbell. It would take days as opposed to just doing it when I walk past it. You know, I'll go for a walk in the morning, I walk past it and I leave the screwdriver on the, you know, on the side as I come in. So it's like, it's not difficult. All I have to do is unscrew it, take the battery out, pop it on charge it, any morning. And it's stuff like that, that I notice just falls by the wayside. I'll look at it, I've, you know, look at my task list in the morning, go, that can be done another day. Another telltale sign is regarding my to doist visibility. You know, you know, I actually talk about to doist quite often, but that just ends up filtering down and down until it's just my um, scheduled tasks, which is the repeatable tasks, like my Spanish lesson. And yeah. I look at it and it's like, I've got nothing else on. I'm not actually chasing anything. I'm not actually planning to do anything. I'm just doing whatever comes in. So I basically switch from being proactive to being fully reactive and somebody, yeah. you know, I'll just wait for stuff to come in. When I'm, you know, at the top of my game, I'm going out, I'm searching for work and I'm sitting there thinking, do you know what, I could do that more efficiently. I could automate that. Mm. So I know in our next episode, we have planned to talk about automation, but it should be pointed out that this kind of felt like a necessity for me to avoid burnout. Right. So, you know, it kind of, it, it helps in some ways, but um, yeah. Absolutely. I also notice in terms of like pushing back just goals with no real justification, mm. because sometimes you can just push stuff back. Like, you know, if I've got audio work, I can be like, right, you know, I can comfortably say to someone, I'm not going to have a chance to do that this week. I'll do it next week. But if I'm really feeling close to burnout, it will be probably not met with a response or I'll just push it back by a couple of days and be like, yeah, I will get it to you. But, you know, I just need a couple of days, you know, as opposed to setting a due date, which we talked about in earlier episodes, I just a kind of go, yeah, I just basically go, yeah, tomorrow, tomorrow. And then before you know it, it's been, it's been weeks um, because you just kind of go, right, it's not important to me. It's not, you know, it doesn't really matter. Flip it. <laughs> Mm. So yeah, it also materializes in my communication between friends and colleagues, which I notice probably more than anything else as opposed to all of these other symptoms, because I tend to just become a bit more distant and my social interactions are kept to a minimum. Um, as I feel like I have to kind of focus on work above all else. And I just kind of do that. Like it's a bit counterintuitive because you know that work's causing you the stress, but you kind of sit there and think, well, I'm going to work more and maybe i'll get through this ever-growing pile of work and it will get better i totally understand that that reaction and um you kind of take that bad feeling out on your friends and family and loved ones mm. but then it's a strange cycle where it's you know the thing that's causing me stress because it's causing me stress i throw myself deeper into it and actually the complete opposite will get you out of it Oh, no. it's strange i know it's because my responses are limited to like a few texts a day like someone will text me and it'll be like yeah you know simple responses not because i'm angry or anything but because i'm busy or you know yeah. i'm in that kind of that hole of feeling feeling crap really but i kind of feel like this is part of the recovery process from burnout is like isolating yourself a bit because it's you step away from work but you also kind of step away from everything and just you know reflect inwardly and see what happens but mm. for me it's not like uh you know a switch when someone says right you know say for example you've got this big task that's stressing you out massively and you know that's the cause of it because that's all you're thinking about mm. with burnout it's really not the case of somebody coming over to you and saying right that thing that's really bothering you let me take that away because you're already kind of at that point of feeling burned out and feeling the stress the stress doesn't just like wash away instantly and you go right i'm fine because i've had that where i you know I'm I'm actually pretty honest and open with my employer when I'm like I'm not going to get that done or I'm you know I'm going to struggle to get that done and they're pretty supportive in that sense. Um, but sometimes if somebody comes over and it's like you've got an amalgamation of multiple catalysts that kind of get you into that state, you can't just take it away and be fine. It's that's the main symptom of burnout for me. That feeling is still there, and even after you finish the thing, it's still you still have that feeling of kind of stress, anxiety, hopelessness. I totally get that. It's it's different it's a different feeling to just feeling overwhelmed mm. because it's it's almost like a feeling of despair maybe that's too strong a word i'm not sure no, it's but not. it's really not it, it sounds dramatic though doesn't it <laughs> yeah i guess this is my is my point that's what we're here for drama oh yeah you know trust me to to find a word that um that completely overstates the you know the situation but one thing that you actually mentioned that something that actually Kaylee and I were talking about yesterday when I was when I was thinking about uh thinking about this is is posture and I didn't want to steal your thunder on this but I thought actually that that's so true you know you can actually for me I can tell my level of flip it by how I'm sitting you know the the, the further my backside is is towards the front edge of the chair 
the more <laughs> the more flip it I feel. Like, do you know it's, what I mean? No, a hundred percent. I actually only wrote that a couple of minutes ago because I was like, look oh. at look at how we're talking, how we're set up, we're engaged, we're you know discussing, we're having a, a meaningful conversation. And just think about like how you felt when you're feeling crap or you're feeling close to burnout or whatever. And your chair will be down, you'll be leaning back or you'll have your arms on your desk and you'll be hunched over looking at your phone, whatever you're doing. You're not just like engaged this. and yeah, <laughs> exactly. This is as far as I can go. Can you still hear me? I'm just about, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For the listener, uh, I... I leant back on my chair all the way and uh basically like a sun lounger <laughs> I was, it's basically like a sun lounger but that that's you know the, the further back this gets the more i know that um that i need a break so i think you and i are very are very similar in terms of you know how we how we experience these feelings what are the things that you've identified in your kind of current role and, and in your current environment that move you towards that feeling more quickly than you know what are your telltale signs of okay if i'm doing too much of this or not enough of that this is going to send me on this path quicker than than you know than others so in my current role it feels like the longer standing kind of not even necessarily more complex incidents are the ones that lead me down that path like okay. everyone wants the quick wins right somebody calls you up and says this thing's broken and you go you know, uh, okay, Mr. Client, let me have a look at that. And then you fix it and you go, there you go, Mr. Client, they're happy. They send you a survey saying 100% or 10 out of 10. Great work, Dan, you have a good day. The ones where they say, look, we've got an issue and it's been going on since 2015. We don't know what's going on. And you're like, you're looking at the calendar, you're like, it's 2021. Like this has been going on for a long time. And they're like, we need you to fix it. And you're like, okay, <laughs> I can try. But you yeah. know, even those those sort of things just kind of angle towards that burnout feeling because right. you know you're not just going to be able to you're not going to swoop in there and be super engineer and go right i know exactly what that is can't believe it's taken you so long to work out it doesn't work like that it's not you know it's not fairy tale it's not fantasy yeah. through automation and decent documentation i can kind of find my way around the mundane tasks now and day to day but it's examples that require a lot of back and forth and you know I guess if it's the same issue lingering for weeks or months or if it's an intermittent issue, it kind of feels like Groundhog Day because you've got this open loop of doing the same thing. And it just ends up, I kind of identify that early on if it's going to be, a you know, based on experience. I know that it's going to take a longer time and, I, and that kind of leads to that stressy feeling for me. Mm. Um, it's the same with audio projects. You know, you've done audio work as well. Um, mm. You would much rather have a finished song that you can just enjoy and actually like be like, right, I can pop that on on Spotify, or I can pop that on an Apple Music, whatever you're listening to, Deezer, and just enjoy it and be like, that's something I've created. As opposed to like going back and forth for six months, somebody going, can you just um, pop, pop that guitar up a bit? Or snare goes up a little bit. Can you make the snare sound a little bit more obvious? Yeah. <laughs> what? But you know what I mean? Those things kind of all come together because that's in the back of your mind. Like for yeah. them, it might not be six months of back and forth, but for you, it's sitting on your hard drive, it's something you know you're going to have to change at some point. It's not like somebody you know calls you up and says, let's do this now and let's make that snare sound how I want it or whatever. So those things kind of lead towards me burning out quicker um, and not taking time for my hobbies. It mm. exasperates the feeling as well. It's just like a, a vicious cycle, kind of how you were explaining earlier. If you're not going to take time away from work and to focus on your hobbies, I know it's hard because you're, you've got that feeling already. And the last thing you want to do is go upstairs and start playing on your keyboard or plug your guitar in and start just twanging around or whatever. But it's one of the essential things to kind of avoiding burnout. You have to find something that doesn't feel like work. I think one of the things that is prevalent in our kind of modern society, especially for kind of millennials like us who were bought, born in late 80s to late 90s, to be fair, um, there is a always a pressure to turn a hobby into a hustle, mm. right? And when a hobby becomes a hustle sometimes it can lose the joy that makes it a hobby that makes it something that you want to do because you're you've put some internal pressure on yourself to commoditize it or to monetize it or to you know make it something that you can you know share with the world or whatever it might be right it becomes it becomes more than what it was to you and that can actually suck all the fun out of it you know for for me, the music side of things actually, you know, and I've talked about this before on um on, on previous episodes, you know, it was actually 
by and large, apart from some of the positive experiences, it was it was a negative experience because I loved making music and I still love writing music now. But we were trying to monetize it and trying to make it a career. And it was all of that stuff that made it not fun. And, and you know, I think it's very easy to feel under pressure to make a hobby a hustle and we need to break that mindset and or find something that you just can't make a hustle you know one one thing that that comes to mind is you know in in before times we uh us two and friend of the show david bogner went bouldering three times a week right yeah and there's no way that we are ever going to be professional boulderers you know we are all very bad after your incident never again well, never again. Yeah, you know, I, uh, I I fell from a great height at like uh, like Hans Gruber, and you know, my career was over at that Stop. point. <laughs> it tickles me every every damn time. I just uh, I get a black and white flashback of you falling off the wall. And it, <laughs> just carry on, please. I just ignore. So, me. so dear listener, if you ever want an example of what a bad friend is, this is this is the example here. You know, I. I had a traumatic experience um, <laughs> falling almost to my death. And the reaction after about nine or ten seconds of, uh, Joe, you're right, mate. And I go, yeah, yeah, I'm all right, was probably about a minute and a half to two minutes of hysterical laughter. And the sympathy was gone. I felt deflated. And uh, it, it taught me a lot about, you know, keep your friends close, but your enemies closer. <laughs> let's just say, let's just say ne- that. Never bouldered since. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because of lockdown, I pretty much haven't. But joking aside, you've got to find something that allows you to disconnect your brain and, and, and get that joy back, I think. so. Oh, 100%. This is what I've done with the audio side, right? I always talk about it on the podcast as being a business, right? And I'm always like, you know, because that's kind of how I operate it, right? But I choose very specifically whether I want to work with someone based on how their what their intent is. So I've got like a pre-production form where I'm like, you know, what what are your goals as a musician? And by and large, I choose people that just want to release music and enjoy it. Not, you know, if if somebody sends me a message and I respond to them and they're like, yeah, I want to play Glastonbury next year. For me, that's not that doesn't align with what I want to do musically. Like I've got like 60 songs of my own out literally over the last year like just because I enjoy doing it and there's, I've got some fans somewhere, but I don't, you know, I don't know them. I don't engage with them, Yeah. but I just like the whole process of making music, putting it out there and being able to have like a product to show for it. And it's like, I try and instill that with artists that it should be stress-free, like enjoy the creative process and enjoy having a song that you can listen to Mm. without having to do like, I don't think I'd be in a band again, a proper band because I don't want to do all the management. I don't want to do the, the marketing. I don't want to, you know, go to an abandoned warehouse to get a dingy looking photo. <laughs> or a music video. Yeah, I don't want to have to drive to the middle of nowhere to perform. Exactly. Or pay someone three grand to do press for an EP that no one ever listens to. And, you know. Yeah, exactly. Sorry, this, is a tr- this is a triggering topic for me. <laughs> <laughs> I think, yeah, I think you're right. I think, you know, you have to find something in your life that is a hobby and not a hustle. You know, and whether that's just exercising, you know, doing some weights or going for a run or whatever it might be, find something that you can do to disconnect and to relax. And I don't want to kind of cover old ground of what we talked about in episode two, um, but we did go into a lot of detail around how we disconnect in that episode. So um, I, I will refer back to that um, if you want to get any more detail on on what we do. Um, so I suppose for me, you know, I ask myself the questions: What are the things that will send me on the path? to burn out sooner than others Mm. you know i think there's ultimately there's four primary things well actually no there's not four there's three one one is kind of you know two two points are kind of one and the same essentially so the first one is not maintaining a consistent workload such that i end up in the feast and famine scenario so if if my inputs aren't consistent my outputs are then lumpy yeah, you know, mm-hmm. because you you put something in, it takes some time to 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 get to a point where it's ready to ready to close, and then it closes or it doesn't, right? And so if I'm inconsistent with my inputs, then my outputs are inconsistent, and a, an inconsistent output in the world of sales uh, is a source of stress for the salesperson because you know, especially in the organisation that I work for, consistency is everything, and you know it's 
it's the same in a lot of you know SaaS SaaS businesses. You know, you need to maintain a consistent quarter on quarter, year on year growth. You know, and that, and that that's that's the objective. And if it's not consistent, the famine side of it causes the extra stress. And so, in response to that that famine you have to exert extra effort needed to get the engine started again and get things into a, into a better position. And um, on the flip side, you can't overexert. And that's really easy to overexert to try and correct the path because mm. you've, you've had a period of famine, you've had a pre- period of under, underperformance. So you have, to, you have to make up for lost time, right? And that's fine in principle, but, you know, the amount of effort involved in doing that is is equivalent to burning the candle at both ends right it's it's not sustainable by being consistent you can keep at that level you know at an optimum level so, uh, you know more for, for a longer period of time essentially so that's the first point and you know i've had um a number of years where i've seen that and i and i go through the peak and trough of of you know having a, a light q1 and then q2 is is huge because i've had to make up for lost time q3 is huge because i'm on that kind of that that inertia um but then yeah q4 sort of starts to fall off the cliff a little bit because you know i've um i've, I've run out of energy you know and that that's 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 something that lots of people in in the, in the this kind of transient sort of mindset will experience and you know it's all about consistency if you can keep it consistent then you can just operate at that at that level for a longer period of time before before you know feeling like you need a break yeah for sure the second point is uh taking on too many side projects so i it's fair to say that i probably take on a little too much at work um and then i've got all of my all of my side hustles as well because uh because that's the kind of person that i am i you know i enjoy creating and i enjoy the process of work and so you know but it still isn't downtime to me but i do love getting stuck into a good side project because it's variety and it's fun and exciting and you know it's it's novel and novel novelty you know creates dopamine and so that's probably why why i like it i like that kind of dopamine loop however if i feel myself being pulled into many different directions so if i'm doing too many side projects and it's affecting my my core work then the pressure cooker analogy starts to come back in again where you know that that um that hob is turned up to full blast and i'm i'm starting to boil the, yeah. boil the frog again yeah exactly and um that is probably the thing that will make my stress levels kind of spike that's where i feel it the the the, the most i suppose and the third point is decision fatigue and this has been especially interesting in the last 12 months whereby the number of additional decisions I think we've all had to make in a given day, week, month has skyrocketed. You know, the, the level of the level of things that we need to think about now, on top of the large number of decisions we've already had to make at work around around our normal our normal sort of business as usual, has massively increased. So on top of those normal business as usual decisions that we've had to make. We also have had to make decisions around, okay, how are we going to work in, in, in this kind of you know, pandemic times? How are we going to continue executing on, uh, on the things we need to execute in an economic downturn, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? You know? yeah. in, in addition to all of that, we've also had to contend with, okay, do I need to sterilize my groceries? Is it safe to go for a walk outside with a friend? How safe would it be to go to the shops? Where am I going to find the time to start three new hobbies? Because every article that I read tells me that, you know, in order to really make the most of the lockdown, you need to be a baking expert. You need to start three side hustles and you need to uh, and you need to somehow make it all work in addition to all of your normal responsibilities. So there's a lot of like external pressures at, at this point in time. And, you know, it kind of feels like being on high alert constantly for the best part of the last year and i think that sent lots of people into this kind of pre-burnout phase i mean i've talked to i've talked to other friends and and they've felt this as well they've felt busier than they've ever felt and they felt under more pressure than they've ever felt and they've had less time to unwind and go on holiday because that's that you can't do that and you know it's all of these things that um that even in in the before times were challenges and it's all within the context of that decision fatigue but it's been you know, massively heightened in the last 12 months. And I'll link uh, to an article in, in the show notes uh, 
from BBC Workwise um, that talks about all of this. And, and actually, it was a really interesting article. So uh, it, you know, it, it was where I uh, it was where I found this kind of you know one, one of these points, and it really resonated with me. So I'll um, I'll share that to people in in the show notes. So that for me is you know my 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 trigger warnings, I guess you could call them, um, to sort of think, okay, if I'm doing too much of these sorts of things, then I need to be mindful. So, so Dan, we've talked about the, you know, identifying what burnout feels like to us. And we've, we've identified the things that get us to that place sooner. What are the things that you do in your sort of either your day to day or your what's your eject button sort of scenario? What do you do to avoid burnout or treat the, the symptoms of it? What, what does that look like to you? So I tend to now try and notice this earlier as opposed to just hitting breaking point because as we discussed in like our pillars and values episode and our lockdown learnings, there are good ways of dealing with it. For example, like keeping a journal and deciding how you want to react to certain things and, you know, taking a step back to think. So Mm. keeping a journal and keeping like a mood rating is like a key indicator for me. Like I just rate myself out of one out of 10. And if I see myself declining, like, you you know, you've got to be honest with yourself and say yeah. how you feel, right? If I'm going into my journal every day and I'm putting a two, then I've got to kind of assess what's causing that, like, you know. And for me, I can normally put, like, I have to justify a reason for giving that mood rating. So if every day I'm like, you know, if I'm putting a two and I'm like, well, it's this work, you know, I've got a lot of work on or, you know, I can at least address that and say, you know, what can I do for myself? Like, do I have to talk to someone? Can I delegate that? It's like how we were talking about the social media stuff. Is like, can we afford to take on that, you know, that extra workload between you and I? The answer is probably no. So we're going to delegate that sort of stuff. So um, keeping a journal is like a, a good way to avoid burnout, just in its most basic form. But we've talked about the powers of it. Yeah, you're checking in on yourself because you, I think, you know, to to go back to my my boiling frog analogy, without journaling and, and without kind of checking in with myself every day you could creep up on you without without you realizing and then before you know it you are in you know poops creek and your paddle is is what i just like i'm that. trying to keep this family friendly i know, you know? I, know I get it yeah <laughs> just enjoyed it i've just never never heard that <laughs> well there you go um you are up poops creek without the paddle um and so you know it's so important to 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 check in on yourself so yes. you know, I, I totally um evangelize that point there yeah so i I mean i i I guess the term i use is being hyper aware so i try to be hyper aware of the work i'm taking on by asking myself whether i have time to complete this yeah and trying to set myself manageable time frames which helps when trying to manage this sort of stuff because you could have you know upwards of 50 tasks but if you know what they're you know when they're due and how you're going to do them that's arguably not a stress thing but you could have just two tasks and they overlap with each other and that's causing the stress. Hmm. I'm also, you know, in terms of avoiding it, I'm just getting better at being honest with my colleagues and my employer. I I always try and be honest, but, you know, about your feelings and stuff has always been a bit more difficult. But in terms of like the the pandemic, it's kind of something you have to take on board. So I know know it's, you know, different for most people, but if you can have an open forum with your boss or your colleagues, it eases the stress. Like I am actually, you know, genuinely quite fortunate to be surrounded by a pretty good framework of people who will listen. Sometimes it's not the case and the work will just be stressful because it's the work itself and, you know, the clients that you work with. But I found that it's okay to tell people that you're, you you know, you're struggling with that. I can feel when I'm approaching burnout. So if my boss calls me and said, look, I need you to pick this up, I can happily turn around and say, look, I can do it, but, I, you know, I'm really not feeling great. There's obviously mm. ways you can word it, but just being open and honest about it. Like my boss called me a couple of Fridays ago and I'd had an absolutely stinking week I'd been back to back most days. And when he called me on the Friday, I just saw myself in the camera. Uh, you know, we we're on a video call. He was just like, you okay? And I was like, I'm just pooped. Like, I'm done. Yeah. Like, if you're calling to ask for a favor, then it's not going to happen. If you're calling to wish me a, you know, a wonderful weekend, then thanks. And, you know, I just need this rest. Like, we'll pick it up on Monday. And he was just like, yeah, literally, he was just calling to check in on me. But I was just like, oh, that's good. Instead of saying, no, no, I'm fine. I'm fine. Which used to be my my kind of whole mentality. It's like, if even when I feel like I'm approaching 
breaking point, I'd just be like, yeah, I'll do that anyway. Yeah, I'll pick that up. Yeah. Because that's who I am. It's kind of at my core. Yeah, I'll pick that up. Yeah, I'll do it. As we discussed in an earlier episode, I'm very much a yes man. It's not about the fear of missing out at work, but it's the kind of thing like I, you know, I defined who I wanted to be, which is helpful. And, you know, it kind of goes against that. But sometimes you have to think about yourself. Otherwise, you're going to suffer the consequences. Sounds like a threat when I say it like that. But um, avoiding burnout is kind of something we basically have danced around the last 10 episodes or so. Because I don't yeah. think either of us kind of woke up one day and thought, let's just be productive. It comes broadly from managing stress, dealing with difficult situations and kind of managing multiple input outputs in the modern world. Absolutely. And, you know, I think it's really nice to have an opportunity to talk about the other side of the fence because, you know, you don't wake up and just go, right, I want to be productive. You kind of go, what's causing me stress? What can I do to make that easier? I know we talk about the joy of being productive, but that's kind of because we're through the looking glass. You know, we've experienced some of this. One of the main reasons why people get into something or they get to or they want to make improvements in their life or improvements to the way that they do things is either to gain pleasure or avoid pain. Right. Mm. And I think one of the reasons why I really lent into, OK, I need to have a system. I need to close all my open loops. I need to you know, make sure that I'm not missing anything is because that feeling of missing something and that feeling of waking up in the middle of the night and going, oh, no, I haven't done that or ruminating on something. All of those feelings kind of bundled up together over a period of time in terms of you know, consistent intensity will cause you to burn out will cause me to burn out anyway yeah. you know that that is not a sustainable feeling that i can i can maintain without my brain just going you know and just exploding exactly that was a better noise that was a better noise than the noise i did thank you dan and so one of the things that has moved me through this journey and i'm you know look i am grateful for having the job that i've got and i'm i'm grateful for the the amount of inputs and outputs that I, I have to maintain and, and keep a track of. And I'm grateful for the volume of work that, that I have to do in, in and around, you know, both my p professional ones, you know, and what we do with Thrive Guys, because it pushes me to find ways to get more done without taking on the additional emotional overhead yeah. in getting more done. You know, that is the, the absolute pinnacle of why productivity as a kind of a, a mantra a philosophy is interesting to me it's doing more with less um, yeah. or doing more with the same it's increasing your output without increasing the stress overhead and the the mental kind of burden of it so i totally agree you know we have for the last 15 episodes really been talking about how we avoid burnout because it's all of these different things that we do in order to get more done using the same amount of time effort and on all of the other overheads that come with doing stuff. So yeah, I you know, I didn't notice that in, in your notes. And actually it's like, oh, paradigm shift. You're absolutely right. Yeah, I hadn't yeah. thought of it like that before, but you are bang on. So well done. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> I, I mean, my last Sorry, point. I got really passionate there. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I'm here for it. I, I enjoyed it. Um, the, the one last point I have is that I just, to avoid burnout, I remind myself sometimes that it's okay to do nothing. Completely. Like as you found with your holiday last week, like we were both off. I had a few days working in the garden and doing some laborious tasks based on what my girlfriend slash supervisor assigned me. Site manager. Yeah, exactly. But other days I was just still up early and just cleared out some of my tasks. I didn't do anything. I was like, I looked at my tasks and thought I could, I could mix that vocal today. Yeah. No, like I don't want to. And it's why our website is still in progress because I was just like, that can wait. Like, I'm just going to move it back. I had time off last week and that's when I was scheduled to, I was going to look at it because I've got nothing else planned. And I just thought, you know what? It's, it's good to just do nothing sometimes. I know we, you know, we, as I said, we've got many episodes talking about being productive, but sometimes you need that break to recharge. And that's what holidays for. Like, I don't, I can still be productive on holiday without like going out and chasing, you know, chasing goals every day it's like yeah i don't wake up on holiday in you know a different country and go right let me go and sit on my computer and do something it's like one of my tasks could be to just enjoy myself <laughs> mm. you know it's important to do nothing sometimes because that's that's the time where your body actually just goes right i'm you know i'm chilled and i'm ready to go back into work because you've got your whole system in place that you can just resume you have to go away to come back yeah you can't just have that sitting there you know rumbling in the background waiting for you and stressing you out otherwise what's the point in taking holiday you might as well have just sat at your desk and done you know what you always do yeah and I, and I accept and appreciate that that going away to come back is a lot harder to do 
has been a lot harder to do over the last year but it's still important mm. that you try and do it in some way and i've tried, I, that's what i did uh, you know a couple of weeks ago i i went away and I've, i came back with a renewed renewed sense of energy and renewed sense of excitement about you know the next six months nine months you know because you know, my career is about to about to change and um it's really exciting um and so you know you have to go away and recharge your batteries otherwise you you're not going to be effective at what you're doing and you're not going to be able to show up every day in the best possible way so yeah i totally agree that sometimes it's okay to do nothing yeah so just case in point as well i came back on monday and i just thought it's just something kind of clicked with me and i thought i could automate that and yeah. next task somebody messaged me and said can we um we just want to report on these certain things. Do you reckon it's possible? And there's no inbuilt way into doing it in the software that we use. Mm. And I was like, I probably could. Yeah, I'll work it out. And I just customized the report and customized how we collect the data because I'd come back with a fresh sense when they asked me. And if it was at like the end of the week and I'd been working for six months solid or whatever it felt like throughout COVID, you know, six years solid. Yeah. I would have just been like, oh, I don't think it's possible. No, the software doesn't do it. and You know, you would dismiss it out of hand, wouldn't you? Exactly. Like, no, 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 I can't do that. I can't do that. No, go away. Leave me alone. Yeah, it's not inbuilt and it's not, a, you know, that will be custom. And it was like, but I could probably do it with the automation I've been doing. It will probably take me, you know, a couple of hours. And I've actually got those couple of hours because I've just come back from holiday and nobody's chasing me yet. So, yeah, I'll do it. And it's like the case in point of just actually taking that time away and coming back with the, you know, the positive energy you bring with you as well. Yeah. It's like you're, you know, a WWE wrestler, right? And you take a... <laughs> I like where this is going. You take a steel chair to the head and... I'm shooting from the hip here, you know. It's like you're Mike Foley. Do you remember Mike Foley? Mick. He fell off of... You're, Mick you're Foley, that's Mick. it, sorry. Mick Mike, Foley, yeah. Michael um, Foliage. <laughs> yeah, Michael Foliage. Um, he he fell off the fell off the cage yeah. at uh, WrestleMania and he went away. Obviously, he had... I think he hurt himself quite a bit. But then he came back with a renewed and... With a renewed sense of energy and and you know mankind absolutely murked everybody you know it was amazing so <laughs> I just, this yeah. analogy has gone in another direction entirely i thought you <laughs> yeah i like it there we go he's the one that had the sock on his hand didn't he yeah that's it genius yeah, that's i it. remember that yeah. wrestler yeah yeah i wasn't exactly. even a big fan of wrestling but i just uh, no. i had the game on ps1 so yeah yeah do you know neither was i but it was on after all of the saturday morning cartoons on sky one and so, you know, it was just, you would just sit there and watch it. And it was, it was fine. Pretty good. Yeah. I liked it. You know, I love The Rock. Um, even now, love The Rock. And Stone Cold Steve Coogan. Stone Cold Steve Coogan. Yeah. <laughs> Dan. Um, so thank you for sharing your small, your tactics of staving off the feelings of burnout. Um, I think for me, there's a couple of things that I do that are less around kind of like eject a but eject a seat kind of thing you know not pressing mm. the eject button because sometimes that's not possible right sometimes you're in the thick of it and you have to continue working and so there's small small things that I've done to maintain the the kind of you know the effectiveness of my headspace for as long as possible and the main thing that um that I use is my morning commute and so in the before times that was a drive where I'd listen to a podcast or I'd listen to an audiobook and I've talked about this before on episode two, disconnecting, um, but having a morning commute, which at the moment is literally a 30 minute morning walk and it is rain or shine. So it could be absolutely chucking it down. I'm up there with my with my jacket, headphones in, listening to a book and I do that half an hour walk and I make sure I do it every day. That is non-negotiable because it's the part of the day that I don't let my brain consider work, Right. Yeah. I don't listen to a book about work or something like that. I'll listen to something that's kind of related to productivity. So but so so for example, I've been listening to the last book I started listening to last book I finished was Show Your Work by Austin Kleon. And um that's all about uh, being a creator and being an artist and showing your work as you go through it and not waiting until it's perfect to then kind of share it with the world right and so that's been that's been really good book and it's actually helped me think about how we do things with thrive guys so it's kind of adjacent to my work and yeah. it's not it's it's the headspace that i need to not think about selling software you know it's that's it's, the philosophy it's really i've adopted useful. with music as well is what i was kind of explaining to and alluding yeah alluding to earlier is that sometimes you get the best results just by putting stuff out there as a creator yeah. instead of being like you know we let's go back and forth for 
six to eight months because you might find at the end of it you release it and only five people listen to it so you know unless you've got a big marketing team behind you or you're doing something truly unique like just enjoy it for the creative process and enjoy what you get out of it at the end focus on the inputs not on the output you know get the joy from the process because if you get the joy from the process you don't have to worry about the, the output you know and that's 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 the ideal my morning commute is like my sacred time it's the time that doesn't move in the week it's always there and it is the constant so that's the first thing so second thing is it's the acceptance that i will make mistakes and not everything i do will be perfect a lot of my headspace is taken up by sweating small stuff we've talked about this before right um when we talk about uh fear of you know distractions and failure in previous episodes and sweating the small stuff is massively draining you know, so and if you multiply that over weeks and months with all of the things that I'm working on, this just kills my output, and it's a component to pushing me to burning out. So when I feel like I'm spending too long on deliberating a decision, so if I spend too long ruminating on a on a decision, I try to look at the problem within kind of a rudimentary decision framework, and so I ask myself kind of a couple of questions that then try and get me out of the um, the kind of the, the infinite loop and so I asked myself what will the outcome be if this email proposal decision whatever doesn't go your way you know what is the worst thing that's going to happen right if this doesn't go the way that you want you know and once you've understood that can you live with that negative consequence you know can you live with those negative consequences of this not going your way if it's yes then don't sweat it don't spend time on it just get the output out of the door right don't don't fret over you know the wording or the you know or 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 the decision just get it out because if it doesn't go your way then okay you know you've already decided that you can live with the negative consequences so it's really not that much of a big deal right you can always make another decision exactly now if that answer to that question is no then schedule it schedule time to really focus on crafting what you're wanting to say or achieve and give it the time it deserves so clearly it's important enough where the consequences of it not going your way are so dire that it must be this life-affirming decision that you need to make or this life-affirming proposal that you need to write. So give it the time it deserves. As I said, Joe, I'm living for the drama. So this yeah, is theatrical I and I love it. You know, it. I did have two strong coffees this morning, so that might be, a, that might be it. As a follow-up to that question, the next question I ask myself is, does this thing push you closer toward any of your goals or your seasonal theme. You know, if I'm writing a proposal or if I'm deliberating over a decision on what to do with something, I'd ask myself, does the decision push you closer towards any of your goals? So let's say, for example, it's, uh, you know, do I want to buy, do I want to buy a, a magic trackpad, right? Which I bought recently um, to sit along the left-hand side of my uh, side of my keyboard. I'm just saying that because it's there, you know. Mm -hmm. do, does whether I buy this or not, push me towards any of my goals or you know does this align to my yearly theme if not why am i delivering over it just do it you know if you've got the the spare income to do it just do it you know just get it done on a what i call a first draft so don't deliberate on it don't spend any time on it just do it so it's it's those those questions i ask myself so what will the outcome be and if it doesn't go your way can you live with the negative consequences and does this thing push you closer towards any of your goals or your yearly theme? So I try and use those two questions to um, get myself, three questions actually, to get myself to a decision, to an output, to an end goal quicker. And the quicker I get to an output, the more I'm just churning through and the, the engine is running as I, was, as I was kind of alluding to earlier. And so I avoid that whole kind of feast and famine thing, especially in my personal, in my professional life. So the the, the, the next thing that, is really important is delegating but it's delegating whilst trusting in those people that you delegate to to do a good job this is very very difficult for me because i am uh i'm a massive control freak and <laughs> if i could and had the time to i would just do everything myself forever you know automation <laughs> well not even that no i would literally just hand crank everything forever and it would just be me that does everything forever, you know, because then I don't know why I just I'm, I, I have to retain control over things. And um, it's something that as I've been getting older, I've learned more and more to just release things and, and accept that and trust people that 
they are going to if i delegate something to them they're going to be able to execute on it effectively you know and a really easy way for me to avoid burning out is to do less work obviously it sounds so straightforward and obvious but that is the the path of least resistance just do less yeah but sometimes on that right is just exactly on that point sometimes delegation is actually a cumbersome process because you're so involved in it i, I found that that's like i would love to de- to delegate some of my stuff and that's what i'm doing at the moment yeah but the process to get me there hasn't just been like you know let me for example drop you a call and say joe can you start doing this because you go yeah, yeah well what does that entail and yeah exactly. how do i do it and where is that and what do i do it for when do i do it so a part of my process of creating my own bot has been automating that process to send something to someone and say can you do this task for me yeah click you know click this link here this contains all of the steps to do it so then i feel comfortable in delegating that if someone does it wrong i'm like well you know you've just not followed the instructions check step yeah. four and try it again like i know where you've gone wrong instead of having to go you know let me sit with you for two hours whilst i explain this process of how i yeah. collect this data and how i present it and all this sort of stuff so at that point you might as well just do it yourself exactly exactly why it's hard to delegate but once it's done it's done and yeah. that level of trust is like a really hard thing to let go of like i really resonate with that yeah absolutely I, yeah you're absolutely right and i think that's where i struggle with it's like do you know what it's going to take me as long to explain it to someone else than it is just to do it myself but actually the value in it's the whole give a man a fish teach a man to fish you know yeah, if you yeah. delegate that out to someone else okay you're having to explain it to someone once but then it's a one and done hopefully um so yeah totally totally get that and i do struggle with delegation um you know i mean case in point you know you're better at it than i am you know we're struggling we, we've struggled a little bit around doing some of the social media stuff because of our time and, and actually you know it's not within either of our wheelhouses you know with thrive guys to do a lot of the social media stuff it's not in our area of expertise so i asked you to pick it up um and within 24 hours you'd out you'd outsourced it and you've got a plan together and it's like right okay boom 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 boom, boom it's gone it's done and actually it's like oh, i wish i did more of that that just is a good idea you know but you're right you know it's the process of getting it up to a point where it can be delegated effectively that's the challenging bit but if you can get it right it's it's amazing and you know one thing i just wanted to sort of um just point to in terms of some follow out to something else that people yeah. should um sh- should take a look at for additional context here um thomas frank who is a, a youtube person uh, he recently uploaded a video uh, that talks about his dad decision framework and that's dad with two d's either side of the a and um that is do it delay it automate it delegate it or delete it and i loved that it was a really great video and i'll put a link to it in the show notes um and you know it kind of it made me start to realize hang on a minute if i sort of use that five-step process actually i'll probably end up delegating a lot more than i do and that is only a good thing um from, from my point of view so yeah i would i'd recommend that um, people take a look at that it was a really good video really good video so my final point is making weekends about quality time so one thing that i've learned about myself is that being a vegetable over the weekend and not spending quality time with my friends and family doesn't doesn't recharge my batteries it doesn't you know and it's something that i've been very has been a bit of a paradigm shift for me in the last 12 months where you know we've not had anything to do at the weekend it's been difficult to do anything meaningful and anything you know social at the weekend and so i've been ultimately living a singular life of work sleep work sleep and then tv video games at the weekend and that tv and games at the weekend clearly hasn't been charging my batteries you know because it, it's not been getting me to that point where i feel that good feeling as much as the more you know variety filled social life that i had before that we both had before yeah. you know um and you know variety in my social life is really key to recharging my batteries it's the spice you know, of life it's the spice of life you know laughing with friends eating good food having that kind of interaction you know that's why i go to work i go to work doing what i do i enjoy the process but the output is earning the you know getting the the financial reward so that i can enjoy my outside of work life you know and provide for my family and you know not have any um financial concerns or worries you know that's why i work so hard right that is my motivation and you know without any of that enjoyment at the end of it the work can feel very singular and very like you know 
it pushes you to that flip it point much more quickly so you know i'm very very excited for for returning to the time where we can have a more uh diverse spicy social life um, because that for me is a is a way that i do definitely recharge my batteries so um so yeah that would be that would be my final point in terms of uh the tactics yeah let's resume the spicy friendships <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> i love a good spicy friendship <laughs> So yeah, so that's me. So that, that, that's that's been a really, a really good conversation today, Dan. It has. I mean, I don't know whether you've got anything that you wanted to to wrap up with. Any final thoughts before we uh, we get on with the rest of our days? Yeah. So I was texting a friend last night um, about burnout, and just they were asking what we were talking about on the podcast, and we were just kind of having a little bit of a chin wag. And he just said, this is a really interesting quote from Sherlock Holmes, which is obviously a fictional character. But um, Okay. So the quote is, life isn't supposed to be painless. Joy and suffering dance together long into the night. Nice. And it kind of made me think about the whole burnout thing. Like, it's it's not going to go away. Like, mm. and, and acknowledging that is like, you know, a very key part of being able to deal with it. Yeah. Because a few years back, I ended up getting really ill because of burning out because I was, you know younger and i just wanted to, i was earlier on in my career and i just wanted to prove that i could do the stuff that i i could do so i'd yeah. get ill and then be like no i'll still work i'm fine like i can still work i can pick that up I, or i'm at home i can still just work you know i might mm. be being sick but I'm, I'm not being sick you know on the hour every hour i could probably do some work in between and it just made mm. me so ill I, I ended up like being off work for a couple of weeks just never oh, happened wow. in my entire career like I've, you know unless i've had surgery or something like that so mm. Yeah, you know, life isn't supposed to be painless. You can't live a completely stress-free life, but it's just kind of ma- managing that, I guess. It's finding the balance. Yeah. Not all of us are going to be in a situation where, you know, and not all of our listeners are going to be in a situation where they get up every morning and, and they are, you know, intrinsically in love with what they do for a job, right? And so, you know, it's difficult sometimes for a lot of people. You know, my dad was, uh, he hated his job for his entire life, right? He was good at it, but he didn't enjoy working, right? His his value system was kind of at odds with what every organization he probably worked for kind of was 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 sort of, you know, was was spouting, if you see what I mean. And so, you know, he got joy in providing for his children and for going on holiday and finding that time outside of work that's like, okay, this is the reason why I do this. And so whenever things got tough, he would just remind himself that this is why you know, going on holiday to Cornwall and going, you know, body surfing with my kids and with my friends. And, you know, we had some amazing holidays and it was, you know, thanks to my dad for, um, for, for kind of facilitating all of that. Right. Um, big up Mickey P, yeah, you big know, up, respect. Um, and so like, it's, it's finding that peace that provides balance. Thanks everybody for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider subscribing to our show. And if you really, really liked it, please consider giving us a five-star rating. Yeah, that really helps us out, helps us grow our audience. So you know, only if you loved it, but if you did, then that'd be really good. If you'd like to hear more from Dan or myself, please follow us on Twitter at ThriveGuysPod. Otherwise, we'll see you next week. Say goodbye, Dan. Goodbye.